Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the demo day. Uh, we don't have much to say, but I, I did like um, a collection of the photos that we took. Well, this is the first to say that we were only really able to do in presence on the, on the theoretical part. I mean, it's a, a big shame, and we are really sad that we couldn't we couldn't uh, work it for the projects in in one go work. But anyway, I hope that in a, in any other time we can uh, meet each other again and, and work together. So from my side, I only have to to thank all of you for coming on the Saturdays. It was really really nice to have you and. And learn more together, and it's just some photos here. I think uh, the machine learning guys and um, the activity that Jordi did upstairs. I don't have much to say, and it's only to thank all the people for coming and for being here today, all of you for working hard and doing your projects. And today is your day, so we will see. And, and this is the talk that Jordan invited. And last, thank all the, all the mentors, especially Jordi, Albert, Marcos, and Agustin, and Elvin, that's not here today, for being with me and all the Saturdays and making this great team. team. And, and now, now I will give the word to Anchoca Aero, that is the CEO of Logistic, and he's going to explain a bit how they work in, in the company and what they do, how they apply machine learning technologies to the clinical, clinical to solve clinical problems. So, so um, thanks as well for inviting me to this event and uh, my, my thoughts were like, um, rather than making a presentation with so many slides and boring you in a, in a Saturday morning, I wanted to make like something useful, maybe. So uh, in Heuristic, we are making like a kind of biometric software to identify patients. So basically, uh, the, the, the normal uh, biometric uh, software work, for example, uh, taking a photo of a fingerprint and comparing two photos. But we want to implement uh, our artificial intelligence in that system. But... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, first of all, I, I, I want to start like with a short intro about my life or whatever. I study um, administration and finances, but when I finished the degree, I didn't know what to do because it really was like, okay, I have lost four years of my life doing something that I don't really think that is going to be a change maker or something like that. So I, I went to work for ExxonMobil in in us basically when i was there i realized that working for big companies wasn't so fun so i decided to make like a startup uh, when we started with the software um, we realized that all the biometric software that were in the market were bullshit basically because they were saying that they were making uh, such an improvement for example with face recognition or with fingerprint identification but what they were really doing is a normal software, basically comparing two fingerprint photos, like the mobile phone. But we wanted to go one step ahead, and basically uh, we, we found like three amazing girls for our artificial intelligence team, who is part of them also. And uh, what we want to do is basically uh, obtaining a pattern or a pattern from the fingerprint. And uh, we, we used the artificial intelligence uh, imaging, or we want to use it to obtain a pattern. That pattern gets encrypted, and we compare encrypted um, patterns. What's the, revolution, the revolutionary thing about this? That no one in the world is doing something like that. If we obtain a, like a good success doing the, doing the system, we are going to be the first one in the world using artificial intelligence for fingerprint recognition. Why are we using fingerprint recognition? Because, for example, uh, the other companies are making um, face recognition, iris recognition, and all those kind of stuff. But the thing is that um, 
when you really want to implement such a, a biometric software in healthcare, because we want to help health entities to identify patients with a fingerprint. For example, if you are unconscious in the street, they are going to come with our software and the hardware we use, they are going to put the, the patient fingerprint and obtain valuable data. For example, the medical record. Uh, this right now, they are just taking your wallet from your from your pocket and trying to find any information about you and they really know anything. I mean, you can be allergic to penicillin and the first thing they are, they are going to give you is like a kind of drug with, um, with, with such a component. So basically, we want to implement our system, for example, in operating rooms to verify your identification before an operation in recovering rooms to get you the correct treatment and for ambulances when they find a unconscious patients in the street to put their fingerprint and know something about you. Uh, the, the, the lectors we use come from the FBI in the United States. They are actually the, the ones that they use in airports and things like that. They work with ultraviolet, ultraviolet lights to obtain the most uh, accurate fingerprint photo. So I don't want to make this too long, but basically um, we obtain a pattern from the fingerprint and with do those patterns, uh, we, we encrypt them and we compare encrypted code. So basically um, what we make is first of all, um, an AI mod model that is more far more accurate than the actual models. And uh, we, we give a, a, an additional security level because in the other hand, uh, right now, if they steal the fingerprint photos, they can fake them and like supplant your identity. Uh, what I really uh, want to encourage you um, in the AI world is uh, the multidisciplinary people. For example, uh, right now we are talking with one IBM um, data science, um, which uh, studied criminology and now he's a data science. That's a perfect profile for us because he has been like in criminology world for a, for a couple of years and now he's like working for, for IBM making like AI models. I really think that that's the future because if you just know about AI or just programming, I mean, you are one part of the way, but if you really know like some parts, for example, myself that I know uh, finances and I, do, and I know also like um, things about technology, I can measure uh, both, both knowledges and obtain something valuable. For example, in electronics uh, with AI or like Usue, like she studied biology and now she, she knows programming and those, and those artificial intelligence coding and, and everything. So I really think that that's the future and that's the really key about like making the difference. And uh, to end that with this like short intro, uh, for me, it's a, like a, a really fun like uh, sentence saying that um, artificial intelligence and big data are like the like a teenager uh, virginity because uh, everything uh, everyone says that they they know uh, doing it. Uh, everyone says that uh, uh, everyone says that they know doing it. They know how to do it, but in reality, anyone know how to do it. Thank you, and John, for your, your introduction to, to this thing. Here you have a bunch of, of people that are far, know far, far more things than me, and they have they shown that they, are, like, like, they learn quite, quite fast. fast. And here, here we also, it's, it's, it's like a demonstration that, that people coming, coming from really different um, backgrounds yeah. can put together the ideas or the things that they want to do and work in a project and learn how to coding in, in an artificial intelligence. So, sure. um, you will see now with the project. So, the, the first one, the, the first team presenting is the team of Antonio, Eva, and um, Ali, and all. Yes, we are going to present our project that it's called Adrian. And we are a team um, formed by, Tony, next. Yeah, yes. Okay, we are Albert, Antonio, Asma, Ali, and me. Next one. Um, our idea was to move a drone using our eyes. 
um, we found a paper with the structure that we can see in the first picture where you place um, the electrodes up, down, left and right of the eyes and a reference that would be A. The kind of signals that we can achieve, it's like the, the middle one. Um, once we move the eye, for example, uh, the direction where we move it is the up one, I, the down one. So here, for example, we are looking and then with these signals, um, we pretend to move the drone in the same direction. So next. Um, our idea is to use uh, uh, open VCI system that my partner Tony is going to explain. And we have placed the electrodes as we saw before in his face, like in this picture. So Tony, can you explain us how we got the signals? Yeah, so this is like the end-to-end -end system and the, the, the idea is to collect um, some data from sensors placed in your head. Then this goes to a ganglion board, which is the an open BCI hardware that you can buy for $250 more or less. Then the idea is to collect, collect and process, process all, all this data. data. It can it be can real, be real time, time using brain flow, brain flow or, or, or other, other systems, systems, or it can or be, it can be like, uh, like a recording, recording with open, with open BCI, BCI user, user interface. interface. Then, then the idea was, was to get some detectors and also pre-process a bit the data. And based on that, um, that detector gets chunks of data that we could feed into a convolutional neural network, network or another kind of classification to decide where we should move. If it's down, up, left, right, or going to the center. The idea then is when we have an, an output, we can send this to, to a drone controller API saying that we want to move up, for example. Then uh, with this drone controller API, we are going to control the Telo drone API, which is the, the, the API that sits in the drone, by saying what we should do, moving up, down, left, or right. Then there are three main parts. The first part is the data acquisition and pre-processing and detection, then the classification using AI, and then the third part uh, using the drone controller. Um, our idea was, was to use a microservices approach, so the parts are interchangeable, and if at some point, for example, we, we, we would like to use, instead of eye movements, we would like to use brain thoughts, for example, by placing sensor in your head instead of in the face, we could do it in the future. Um, yeah. yeah, so that's the end of system. Now, now uh, I, want I want to show you uh, how, how we record, record data sets with the user interface. interface using uh, the ganglion board plus sensors plus the open BCI user interface. So this is an example recording, a real, a real recording that we did for, for, the data, for the data set. So this is me, so this is me uh, uh, moving the, the moving eye. The, the eye. So, so now you will, now you will, you will, this is, you will see a this movement. is a movement going up, going up. This, uh, this, uh, yeah, yeah, I see the, the, let's see the, this is a link for me. This is so a now link. the movement going so up. So now the movement then going up. You now see a movement going up. Then another movement going up. Like looking up, like then looking up. Then center again, center, center again, again. Or first recorder, or first recorder. Detect, detect what are the, detect patterns. what are the patterns. patterns for now. Yeah, for, for different movements. Now we went, uh, we recorded some data sets, but then we wanted to do this also real time. And to do that, we had to acquire data row uh, from the, directly from the board, from the hardware board. And uh, the idea was to do also real time detection. So we can, every time, for example, this, this is an example of a detection in real time. So in here, for example, we are detecting valleys and peaks for different channels. So for example, as we have seen before, uh, when we detect a valley, uh, this is the, the correct movement. So in this case, you, the correct movement would be down and all the peaks are the are peaks, but they are not giving any valuable information. The, value, the only valuable information is that something is happening, but this is actually saying that we are moving down, for example. 
Uh, the idea then was to yeah, visualize this in real time as well. So we had a time flux monitor, and then also to send this information in chunks to the neural network. But <laughs> unfortunately, there are some parts missing. Uh, so we didn't have time to do every everything. Uh, so the real time processing part is quite challenging. For example, the part of uh, getting chunks of data in real time when an event happens and pass this to the neural network, uh, making this work in real time was not easy. Then uh, pass the output of the neural network to the drone API in real time. This also is not very easy to do and we should continue investigating on REST versus web sockets to connect with the drone uh, in real time. So yeah, uh, next is... Um, okay, now I will explain yeah. you how we, we prepare the data. So in a further step, we can um, train the model. So firstly, we got the, well, funny at here is the, the data, and we developed an algorithm that could um, detect every, every movement so for example, if you go up, we can detect the up movement and we can chunk it into a into lens that are the same for, for each one. So uh, with that um, with that method, with that algorithm, we could have more than uh, 200 chunks. So it was, I mean, we needed more data, but uh, we could we could have done it uh, better. But um, but you can see that all the chunks are the same, and by inserting them to the training model. Uh, we can we can do the the deep learning algorithm uh, well better and well yes it's pretty much that. Okay, so now for um, training the model, we need some data. So um, due to the situation that are we in now, we just done one person that it's Tony. He's the one that um, got the data, and the tests that we have done are. Um, three different, like center to up, that would be the up, center down, center left, and center right. It's important to return to the center because otherwise the signals wouldn't be the same. If you go center up and center, you will always like get the same signal. Otherwise, there would be a lot of variations. But, Tony? Yeah. Okay. But as I said, we have problems with the data. Um, we wanted to have multiple sources of data. That means more than one person because otherwise, um, even the fact that when you move the eyes, um, everyone tends to have the same signal, it's not the same. It implies more variation. Um, also, we wanted to have a lot of records, but that hasn't been possible. So um, the solution for that lack of data is to do that augmentation that Asma is going to explain us now. Next. Okay, so for the learning approaches for the project, we will start by the data augmentation process. Then we will go to a machine learning approach to solve the problem. And then we will go to the architecture, um, the deep architecture that we have uh, chosen for this problem. Next. So we start with the data augmentation. As we all may have seen uh, prior in this uh, Saturday's IIs, in uh, whatever vision problem, there is something called data augmentation, where you change, uh, where you do some transformations in an image, and then you get more data to train your model. In our case, it was not an image, it was a continuous signal. So instead of uh, instead of doing uh, transformations on the image with the transformations on the signal, what we have done is that we have chosen randomly a certain number of time points from the signal, and then we have uh, modified the positions of those um, time points. We stretch them within the interval of the mean and max of the signal. That helps to have more data for training, and we had a less biased model since we only had one sample to test. And the noise that we have generated with the time uh, points that we have modified their position helped to train better the model. Next. Okay, so first of all, we had the machine learning approach, which is an SVM. Let's remember that we have five classes to classify. We have uh, from we have a right class, 
up, down, and left, and we have the center class as well. For the feature vector for the SVMs, we had the mean, the max of the signal, and we have the variance of the signal as well. And we have uh, five classes to classify. The best accuracy we could reach so far was the 43 accuracy. Next. Then we come to the deep learning architecture. Uh, since we have a few data, we have uh, uh, prioritize prioritized more uh, articles on uh, EEG uh, treatment and recognition, but the ones that had uh, few data um, that needed few data to train. The one that we found most interesting was this one. It's a paper from 2018, and it gives a fully supervised architecture, which uh, they claim that needs few data. The architecture is very compact, so it doesn't need a lot of space. And there is a good engineer behind the model because uh, the people who worked on the article actually uh, tuned the model very well. So it could um, be a very good bait for our problem. Next. So using this architecture, we have modified the number of channels since the number of channels in this uh, article was 120. Uh, we have modified the first layer of the architecture. So the number of channels could be five, four. And we also, we have modified the uh, number of time points in um, an interval of time since our frequency was not the same. Ours was 100 Hertz. The best accuracy we could, we could reach with uh, this architecture was uh, 51, 50, was 50.1. And then we go to the drone. Albert? Yeah, so uh, for the drone part, uh, well, we had the, tra the trail drone. drone. Uh, this drone already has some, uh, some like API to communicate with, with him and some calls that you can do, do to, to, to manipulate it, to make it fly. So <clears throat> what we did is creating some uh, Python API to, to do all these things. And at the, at the end, we created like a public uh, application uh, to be integrated in all our, uh, our system. One of the problems that uh, <clears throat> that we faced is that the, the video needs to be uh, in the main thread because uh, because of uh, the Mac uh, requirements, and uh, this this was a problem because uh, we wanted also to run the, the the rest of the application at the same time. So we started thinking, and at the end, we we thought that maybe a Flask application could be a good option. And that's what we did at the end. So uh, now with the uh, Flask uh, application, you can make simple uh, network requests and you can manipulate the drone uh, with this. But we have another problem. So I have the drone here in my house, but the rest of the team is not here in my house. So uh, it's kind of hard to uh, manipulate the, the drone uh, with the signals that are from the Tony's houses uh, with a, in a, with a, to a drone that is in my house, so we hacked the uh, we hacked uh, hacked a bit the system. We created a port forwarding in the in the in my router, so we are able to uh, to connect to the drone uh, from outside from my home and uh, manip manipulate it. And now we have like a short demo to show how it works. Uh, Tony, let me uh, yeah. let me first run the application. I'm gonna run the application locally, and the the drone is uh, connected here in in my house, so I am ready. No, first, uh, yeah. Okay. Now we are recording. Do you see me? Yeah. <laughs> it's from it's from Tony's houses. Okay. And, and you can send the. Uh... Yeah. Now I'm going to send a take off. Wait a moment. Yeah. Yeah. The idea is that this <laughs> was loud via the 
the AJ, but well, it will come. <laughs> and then you can like send the now, right, right or left, and it's turning. You can send some left. Here again. And now we can land it, for example. And that's it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we can control the drone <laughs> from one home to the other. <laughs> and that's it. That's my presentation. Oh, it's really nice. Okay, so The next group, I don't know if, if the group of Anna, Bea, um, do you want to present now? Yes, okay, so go on. The stage is yours. Okay, so as I just said, we are Anna, Bea, and, and Carla, and this is our project, which is, as you can see, is wildfire risk prediction. So, well, next. Okay, so when we were surveying the data sets available to work, um, um, we installed someone from the Kaggle and other open data sources, and uh, we just uh, came across this one, which was, which was about um, all the Catalonia wildfires for more than 30 years. So uh, in, this data was gathered by the Departamento de Agricultura, Ramandaria y Pesca, and we were like attracted mm, with this information and we decided that we might uh, try to uh, create this model. Uh, so we chose this topic because it was it, it has a high topical relevance and as well um, it's kind of interesting because it has a geospatial component which none of us really knew a thing about before because our backgrounds are bioinformatics and marketing so mm, any idea about it. Mm, then uh, <laughs> As I just said, we really like the topic. So you can see that the goal is um, detecting the wildfire risk areas in Catalonia. So yes, as tools, we um, we have used a classifier algorithm, and then for the visualization, we have used the Uber H3 model. Next, please. Well, this is the uh, the process, the process uh, phases of the project, but at this point, I think that you already know them. So yes, we can just move forward. Yes. Thanks. Um, okay, so first of all, we, we first have uh, had to learn about wildfires because, I mean, we have to learn its processes, the causes, the consequences, and and so in order to define the variables of interest and of course the limitations of the project. And second, we have to we have to decide the area of interest. But of course, as the data set was from wildfires in Catalonia, and then of course the area is Catalonia. So. Um, and at some point, we had to research if there were if there was any other model or tool used to to predict this this risk. And of course, there is. Um, there's one from the, uh, uh, the Departamento de Agricultura, Ramaderia y Pesca, but it's a little bit different to uh, to our approach because it's less geographically precise. As you can see here in the image, it's based on the counties or comarcas, and our um, model uses the H3 uh, uh, distribution that we will see later. And then, uh, uh, um, <laughs> yes, of course, uh, an interesting part of our project is that it can grow in complexity because in this first um, proof of concept, we have used some variables, but if we continue working with this, we can add other variables like, uh, for example, population density or leisure and tourism data. So we can add like layers and the model can grow in complexity. Next, please. So here you can see the, the, the variables that we have. We, we can divide them into groups, which is uh, the, the ones that are variable, uh, sorry for the same name as it says, and the other is invariable. Um, invariable data, we can see the terrain characteristics, which are like the type of soil then the climate zones and the vegetation. And in the variable data, we have, of course, the time and place of the fire, which means uh, like the date and the coordinate. And then in the weather observations, which include the temperature and relative humidity, 
uh, wind speed, which marks the minimum, minimum values, and then um, the rate. Not only daily, but also seasonal, <coughs> and, like month, the month uh, mean. Okay, next, please. Uh, yes, so here are the sources where we, um, uh, that we use to gather the data. So it's the Institute Cartographic, the University of Barcelona, and and uh, Meteo Buncat, and um, yes, for the weather we had kind of a problem because um, uh, there is a there's a historical meteorological um, register which is from uh, 1986 till uh, uh, 2018. But the problem is that it's not re it, it doesn't have a lot of information because it's kind of old. But we also have the, the, the weather stations API, which is a kind of important part because Catalonia has a lot of weather stations that are uh, daily gathering data about the weather and other variables. But um, they just go from 2009 to, to nowadays. So we had to like um, work on that because for some um, years we have a lot of information, but from others we didn't have uh, that much. So we had to work on that. And then, well, of course, we have like the type of soil data set, the climate zones data set, and the vegetation data set. We also tried to um, to get the wildfire causes data set, but uh, it was kind of a problem because um, La Generalitat de Catalunya, and actually I contacted them, and they said <laughs> that it's not publicly available because the the, da the data of the, of the wildfires are kind of sensible, so the sensitive. So they, they didn't want it to share it. And it was kind of um, surprising because actually I found that causes data set of wildfires in, in the US and they were like so public <laughs> here, they were not available. So we just couldn't use that. Okay, next, next please. Yes, yeah, so for the visualization, uh, we initially wanted to base the risk distribution in a square grid, but um, Albert suggested, and thank you Albert for that, and uh, it was the US H3 grid system, which is, as you can see, uh, it's based on hexagons. So the main difference, uh, maybe some of them, uh, some of you, you already know it, but um, is that hexagons have only one distance between a hexagon middle point and its neighbor's middle points. So compared to, to a square, they have two distances or three distances in triangles. For example, you can see it in the Hima, in the Hima. And this property, it, it, it's really useful because it, it simplifies the performing analysis. And actually we have used a lot of this midpoint information for, for the prediction, you, you will see it later. And uh, um, yes, yes, next. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so yes, at, at some point uh, we, have to, we have to choose whether if we wanted to use like a, um, a geographic kind of distribution based on municipalities or municipios or another um, more uh, uniform, which is based on hexagons. And this is the one that we use. And this is also the difference between uh, our model and the model that the La Generalitat has or uh, is using right now. So, yes. So we, we chose the right one, yeah. And here you can see, um, well, we start visualizing, visualizing our data. And this uh, is uh, all the wildfires that we have from 1986 till till today, um, and well, of course, the years are overlapped, but um, these are all the wildfires that we have had in the, in this past year. Yes, next. And here, of course, um, here we started like um, um, crossing the, um, like different information. For example, on the left side, you can see of course the hexagon. And we overlap the um, weather stations that we had. So you can see um, that they are like distributed all over Catalonia, but some points have more than others. And we actually used a K KNN algorithm for defining which climate station is the closest to a fire, and also which climate station is the closest to a high So these two stations are going to be really helpful for making the, pred the predictions, but we will see this um, later. Yes, thank you. Uh, next. Yeah, so, yeah, we started gathering data and we very quickly realized that we had some big challenges ahead of us. Mainly, we 
potentially or like more than surely had an imbalanced data set because at the end of the day there are always going to be more non-fire uh, data points than fires um next you'll see how we handle this but it was this was a big part of the of the yeah data handling uh and then the whole data gathering process was very tiring like we used more than 10 different data sources they all had different formatting and we pretty much had to yeah study each of these data sources to actually be able to put them together so uh yeah, even within the Department of Agriculture and such, like each people handles data as they want, as they want. So that's uh, that was tough. Um, then also a variable that we had no access to was human intervention, which we, you know, probably has a lot of impact on these wildfire, uh, um, on these wildfires, and we unfortunately couldn't find anything about this. So for the moment, this is just you know a proof of concept using the data sources available to us and for the moment only with meteorological and uh, soil and climate data. Um, and also besides the cause of the of the fire, we couldn't find any data source that, that told us where the fire was initiated. It only had, uh, yeah, like the general geometry form of the fire. So we ended up using the midpoint so we can actually, you know, pinpoint it and associate it with a specific uh, coordinate and um, and, geo and weather station. And then H3, that was a whole beast on its own because we had never even worked with geographical data. And um, there were only like two notebooks, the whole internet that talked about H3 or that explained you how to use it. So... Yeah, that was interesting. <laughs> um, then for the whole data cleaning process, so pretty much our, as already um, Carla talked about, our biggest issue with the data set was that we had on one side a full data set that had a uh, few variables, um, but a lot of data points, and then an API data set that had a lot of variables, but very little data points, especially because the old data um, like the one that going from 1986, uh, this dealt only in month, uh, in month data. So you have the month temperature, the month humidity, whereas the API data set had like recollects data from yeah every half an hour, every day for every variable in all of the weather stations. Um, so as you can see, for example. Some of the some of the all of the day related variables like yeah from the second to the tenth these are from the API and of course the minimum was seventy two percent of missing data so of course this was unutilizable for this uh, data set and then if you only use the API data which is from two thousand and nine uh, only the wind velocity and the wind direction were um, yeah, had uh, important um, values missing. So we cleaned all of these um, numerical data. We uh, filled the NANs with the month um, with the month values of that specific variable. But in the case of the old data set, we pretty much had to drop all of these day variables. And as you can see, the one on the left has 1,400 rows, and the one on the right only has uh, yeah, it has less than 400. Um, and then for the categorical data, which is mostly soil and climate zones. So we also had um, a vegetation data set, but that had, I don't know, more than 2,300 or, yeah, it was too much information and it was not the easiest to handle. And at the end of the day, we decided not to use it, mostly because we didn't have the time to, to actually process it properly. Um, then for the soil and the climate zones, we also had a lot of variables. So the first step that we did was try to group them together. Um, and again, this is very uh, topic related uh, naming. So Carla had to study a lot about uh, uh, topographic and, and yeah, um, soil related information. So we grouped them into 
uh, variable that had uh, similar characteristics, and we left that in the data set. Uh, we ended up with only four weather uh, uh, classifications and nine uh, soil, nine or eight soil classifications. This is already grouped. So now we had the issue of, okay, how do we want to handle this categorical data? Do we want to one hot encode it or, or do labels or what? So we decided to do one hot encoding and then we decided to, well, which is this first step. Uh, so first we tried it with the whole set of variables and we ended up with like 26 extra columns and that did not perform very well. So we went back to this um, issue and we dropped pretty much all of the uh, variables that had nothing to do with dry or arid um, weather or climate zones. Uh, these are these are only the ones that relate to dry or arid. And then we also try to group them a little bit further and identify those that identify as um, arid or dry and put them into a single column with just a zero or one to identify is it arid or dry or is it not. And we test these two together. Later on, we'll see what... Uh, uh, how it works, but this one was one that performed the best. Um, so when we actually, when it, it was actually time to build the model, the biggest problem was the one of, uh, yeah, which data set to use. On one hand, we had a lot of data points with very few variables or very few data points with a lot of important variables. At the end of the day, the goal of this project is to predict future, um, yeah, future risk zones of wildfires. And for those future risk zones, we'll have the API data available. So we ended up using this one, even though it had less um, data points. We tested, we tested them together and the difference was not that great um, or not that big. So we decided to go with the, with the weather stations API. Yeah, so uh, as Anna was saying, uh, we tested them both, but uh, the difference were not that great, uh, choosing the same amount of years for all and the, just the API data. So in the end, we chose to, to go with less data points, but more information on them. But because of what she was saying, that in the end, we want to predict a future uh, years and for those years we will have happy data so that's what we did and uh here uh you can see that we also choose to have um 50 percent of the data so all the the fires uh, are 50 percent of the data positive and then we added 50 percent of uh no so data uh with uh, negative fires in them okay next yeah, so here you can see the, the comparison between uh, the importances using uh, all data and only the, the API data. And as you can see, the, when using API data, the, the top ones are um, yeah, API-related um, variables like humidity and uh, temperature of the day and everything. So that's why uh, we didn't see that much difference in accuracy, but we chose to, to use all, the, all this information to, to build the model. Okay, so another try that we did was uh, we wanted to to know if uh, the the nodes that we were adding to the model, uh, if there was an impact, um, if we if we chose to to add more nodes uh, within the months that are usually prone to have fires. So if there was a difference between adding just states at random without any um, control, or if um, we should add knows based on the months that are more fires in them. So we did a, a completely random uh, chosen uh, choose of dates. And then we did a one following the proportions of the dates of the fires. And we we saw that the, the, the one with more random dates was uh, a, a, achieved a very better accuracy. So that's the one that we uh, end up following. Yeah, we, 
this is just to to show that we did some other tests with the data we as as Anna was explaining we did the one hot encoding thing with all of uh, all of the types of uh, climate and and soil then we did just some subgroups and then only one column and then we we saw that the only one column was the the better performing one so we we stick with that one and then we we also tried uh, another approach which was uh, adding more so imbalancing the data sort of thing, because as we we said that there's, of course, a lot more uh, days without fires than with fires. So it's more fair to have more no's in the in the data set. But we saw that the the, the accuracy, uh, we will see this data later, but the, the accuracy and uh, of the model were a lot worse. Well, actually, the accuracy was not worse, but the, the F1 score was worse. But we ended up uh, sticking with uh, balanced data because the, the predictions were better. And the last thing that we did was, uh, as you can imagine, there are a lot of uh, correlated values between uh, the, the temperature of the day, the, the temperature of the month, the previous month and everything. And we tried dropping some of them, but uh, we didn't see a, a difference or uh, the model was worse. So we, we ended up sticking with all of them. Okay, so here, as, as I was saying, we, we did not only uh, take, a, take a look into the accuracy of the model, that it's uh, how many of the predictions are actually correct, but uh, the F1 score, that it's a, a metric that takes into account the precision of the model, that it's uh, how many of the uh, positives that we predict are actually positives, and then the recall that are uh, how many of the actual positives are we predicting. And this is important because uh, as I said, we ended up using a balanced data set, so that was not an issue. But as you see here, when the data set is imbalanced and there are more no dates than yes, uh, the accuracy is higher because we have, so by, by, by the definition of the data set, there are more no's. So if the model predicts a no, it's, it, 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 by chance, it's um, a lot likely that it's correct. And the F1 score just takes into account, okay, but if we want to look for a yes, so for a fire, are you correct all the time? And as, as you see, the, there's a major drop in the F1 score. So we, we kept looking at, at both metrics, but th this was not an issue when the data set was balanced. But yeah, we, we thought it was interesting to keep looking at both of them. Okay, so next. Yeah, so we ended up testing for, um, for different classifier models. Um, Adaboost, Random Forest, uh, Exiboost, and Catboost. And yeah, we we tried different number of trees uh, and different number of learning rates, but we ended up sticking with these ones because they, they, they were the ones that gave the better um, accuracies. And uh, we wanted to test some different random states because we were seeing that uh, changing the random state really changed the, the accuracy values. So as you see, uh, well, yeah. The, it ranges from uh, 0 0.75 to 77, but it drops to 0 0.60 something. It's very variable depending on the random state. Can you go to the next slide, please? Yeah, so here are more of them. This is just to show you that uh, the, the best performing model, it's uh, always changing uh, depending on the random state. So what we ended up doing was uh, taking random forest because as you see, uh, it's the most um, stable one. So it's never the best one, but uh, the, the, the best one or the worst one are interchangeable depending on the on the random state. So we decided to focus on the one that was more stable throughout them. And we and we chose the, um, yeah, the random forest model. Yeah. And, uh, okay, so what we did here was rerun uh, or retrain the model with all the data and obtain the, Sorry. <laughs> the final results. Yeah, you can go to the next one. Okay, so this is the, the end. What we wanted to do at the end was uh, get a probability of, uh, of risk of fire uh, with, within all these hexagons that we talked about. And here we have uh, the, the initial idea that was uh, doing a sort of like a scale of probabilities from one to five with five different colors. And, here you can see the the idea. I mean, this is a, a random uh, picking random numbers for the probability, just so that you can see the, that there are there are five uh, different colors. But uh, reality is, uh, <laughs> can you go to the next one? Yeah. So, 
we chose, so the idea is to do this for uh, future predictions, but since we had to um, generate new, new, new ways to get the, the app information, we decided to do the prediction for a, a specific date in uh, a year that we already had. So we chose this, uh, this date that it's uh, 5 of August because there was an actual fire. So we wanted to see if the, how was the fire in the, in the zone of, of the prediction of the risk. No? So here we have that uh, instead of having five uh, different uh, colors, we just have two because it turns out most of the predictions are within a range of 0 0.4 and 0 0.6 probability. So we rounded up the, the, the number and we, they just came up like this two group. And here the, the, the fire is marked and it's in a red zone, so that's good. But the thing is that for us, we thought that the prediction would be, um, well, the, the probability would, would be much different, but they aren't. So can you go to the next slide? Yeah, so the, there's a limitation of the project that we did not have time to tackle, but it would be a future step because here you can see that for for most of the hexagons, the, the, the amount of uh, probability of fire is, is very close to each other. And that happened when we looked at other dates. So, yeah, uh, that is something that we, we should work on in the future. So it, it we decided to round up any in it. It looks good because there's a, some areas with more probability than others, but we thought it would be a, a lot different. And for the ones that we checked, it really wasn't. So yeah, I think that's it. Yeah. Do you have any questions? We would happy to answer. No. No. Uh, okay. Thank you, girls. I'm really, really proud of what you did because you took a, a problem and. And you really made all the steps that we we saw in the theory. Like, I think that that you have done a, a really really great job. And I hope that this this is useful for you on when you have to face any any project, how to do it and how to to go through all the steps. I think that's great. I mean, perhaps the the, the final step is not what you expected, but I think that the, the idea it's really good and the, and the execution is also great. So Thanks. congratulations. It was, was really great to have you. I have learned a lot Thanks. with you. And... We have learned a lot as well. Yes, <laughs> we just wish we could have been there in person. Yeah. But... So the last group, the group of Marta and... Marta, are you there? You can share your screen if you want. Our project was um, on understanding music emotions. Um, we've worked together with David and me and with the whole project. So what we wanted to do was to build an algorithm to extract sentiment from music, from songs. And we wanted to use both the audio and the lyrics of these songs. Why do we want to do that? Because we wanted to understand why a song is positive or maybe it gives us positive vibes makes us happy. Why a song can make us sad? So we wanted to understand the features behind this idea of music emotions. So what we did, the, the main idea of the present was, okay, we need a lot of songs. So uh, the main idea was to download um, many, many, many songs, which uh, David will introduce you to now. Um, and we wanted to have some layers for these songs and then train our CNN. So that's the whole idea of the project, but David will guide you. Uh, okay, so I will explain the whole process that we have done and everything that we have stored and the data set that we have created here in, in Amazon and S3. So as Marta said, the main idea was uh, to have a list of um, of songs, this is the the million song data set, which provide us a list like uh, like that, okay? Which is a list of the identifier of the song, and you have the name of the song and also the the artist. And as this, we have lots of lots of songs, uh, up to one million, okay? 
So this data set was quite messy. I mean, uh, lots of there were artists who, who shared the same artist ID and uh, the same artist ID and were in different uh, names. And th there were different kinds of treatments that we have to do with data. So basically, the, the first idea was okay, let's see if we can take uh, just the name of the artist and go to YouTube and download uh, the audio. So the main idea to do this was to the artist's name and go to YouTube and search uh, this artist's name and see if we can find by web scrapping, here we use uh, Selenium, if we can see some songs that are in the list of the songs uh, for this, for this uh, million song data set. So the idea was a little bit to see how many songs uh, do we find in YouTube and we can get the, the URL, which is basically the link when you click uh, to a song, this URL that appears here. Up. So the basic idea is with this URL, we will launch a program, oh sorry. We will launch a program, which is called YouTube DL, which basically downloads the audio from this link. So with that, we will retrieve the MP3 file. So this was basically the main idea. So what problems we encountered? Well. We have a uh, lots, lots of songs. I mean, a lot. And to do this uh, in a sequential way, it's uh, quite time consuming. So here we apply the typical philosophy of uh, Divide y Venceras, which is to make uh, parallel uh, downloadings. So basically how we approach this was, okay, let's first of all, uh, make this uh, query of the artist. So we search the artist see how many songs do we find in this artist uh, the page of YouTube and if you find this this song then uh, get the URL so we have like a here which is the my results that we have uh, divided all the songs into um, chunks of what we call batches and each batch contains let's say uh, I don't know 20,000 or something songs so to make it uh, more parallel, parallel this, this task. So we can launch multiple EC2 instances yeah. and, we can, and we can launch every instance and make it every instance to do this search in YouTube. So basically what these files will have is if they found the song, uh, here you will see uh, this. If they find the songs, it gets the URL of YouTube. So here I have all these songs that we found the, the URL of YouTube. And what happens for those songs that he that the algorithm does not retrieve? Well, what we do is we create uh, another folder, which is not much results. And, and here, the not much query, sorry, and here what we store is the name of the artist and also the name of the song, because we want to um, to make more precise search. So if you haven't found the artist, for example, Moose, if you haven't found this song, then search for the name of the song and the name of the artist in YouTube. So what, what this will do in a second iteration is run again this, this query and you search for this song, here it appears. So this algorithm, what, what it does is it looks at the top, uh, I think it was the top 10 entries. And if there's one entry that has all these words of the query in the title. So a way to find a match of the song. Uh, this was done this way because uh, some, some songs, maybe the, only the name of the song is, for example, uh, Weekends. And there are many videos in YouTube that have this weekend. So uh, we want to, or maybe this example, Stop Laughing. Uh, that Many, many videos that are not from, from this artist that has this name. So this was a way to better get a precision of the, of the video and then it gets this URL. So what it does is basically it stores again this URL in the same file and we, we put another identifier. Here is the batch zero and here we, we just add a 1000 if it's the second round because this song wasn't found in the first round. Basically, what, when we have this, all these files, what we do is we, we, we launch another uh, set of uh, EC2 instances 
that what they do is they use a uh, YouTube VL to download these audio sounds. So here in S3, what we do is we parallelize this thing and make um, a file system which contains uh, several folders and within each folder, there are several folders too. And here we have a lot of songs which are the identifiers of the of the song in the million song data set. So here you see that, for example, for BBB, this is the name, uh, track uh, BBB something. And this is a way to store uh, a little bit more um, accurately this, this file. So once we have all these uh, MP3 files, which we have a lot, uh, imagine that we have, well, uh, we have to tell you that we have lots of problems when doing this because there are quite, there are some limits, so you cannot download uh, all the MP3s from, from YouTube. So what we have to do is we have to launch instances all around the world. So we have to make an instance in Singapore, another one in Paris, another one in Ohio. So we visited all the world uh, downloading um, uh, MP3 files from YouTube. So we make a well <laughs> a, a very a global um, a global um, extraction of of audios. So once we have this file system with all the all the MP3 files, what we do is also create another uh, set of instances. That what they do is just take this audio file and um, apply an algorithm that it's called a fast Fourier transform in order to convert into frequencies the audio file. And this way it does, it, it makes an spectrogram of the, of the And a spectrogram is basically a representation in 2D of in the x-axis you have the time and on the y-axis you have the frequency. So at each time you see which frequencies are being the dominant ones in the, in the audio. So the idea was uh, not only to make a representation of one song as all this spectrogram, but to make chunks uh, of this song, just maybe let's say a, a window of 30 seconds of that song. And we go sliding this window uh, over, the, over the song and just create images of 30 seconds. This is because we wanted our input uh, of the model to be uh, something of fixed uh, size. All the songs, uh, as I told you, the x-axis have the time. So the time is variable among songs. There are songs that last uh, two minutes and other ones that last three minutes. So if we make a window and make this a window of fixed length, we can make uh, all these uh, spectrograms um, with, the same, with the same sizes. So uh, once we've done that, uh, we, we just store all the... Uh, all the files for a same track. For example, we have different we, we have different windows: the window zero, window ten, and so on. And then what we do is what Marta will explain is to create a label for this for this song. That this label will be based on the lyrics of the song to see if the song uh, was positive or or negative. And Marta will explain you this part. Can I share the screen? I saw the. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, as David said, um, so now let's recap a little bit. We have a data set with uh, almost half a million songs or more. And then we need the labels, right? So we can train a model. So basically, what we did was to, first of all, we need to extract the lyrics of the songs that we've been able to download from YouTube, right? Uh, because the ones we don't care about. So what we did was to do a scrapping uh, in the same way that David has already shown to you guys. Um, we um, started different AC2s. So instantly, so we would, um, scrap the lyrics from Google uh, in a parallel way. So you know that, um, you know how to scrap because we have done this in the course. 
Uh, so basically, for those who haven't done it, it's um, you you just um, see the Google Chrome itself starts downloading all the songs from Google uh, automatically. So basically, when we had these lyrics, what we did was to use Vader. Uh, Vader is an algorithm. It's already made. Uh, we could have done it ourselves, but it, this wasn't the main point of our project. So we wanted to save a little bit of time. So we used Vader. And Vader, basically what it does, it has a big, big, big dictionary that says uh, whether a word is positive or negative. Right, so here you have an example. So if you, you, we have the sentence, I am good, it will say it's positive uh, to a point of uh, zero seven, uh, et cetera. Okay, so basically what we had was a label that would say how positive is our song or how negative is our song. Um, then we chose a threshold. So if it was over 0 0.5, we would say our song was positive and the same way around, um, zero for negative songs. So basically we have a whole data set, right? Um, David, if you want to explain before I explain the model, do you want to explain how we um, did the data augmentation when we had that? Yes, this part of the data augmentation is the one that I've told you about the windows. So here for one song, we have several uh, samples uh, of the same size, and you can see that the size of this image are all always the same. So this was mainly this this part. And I have to, I didn't tell you, but we got in this S3 bucket, we have 1.8 uh, terabytes of data. So it's a huge amount of uh, data. I think that we have more than 2,000, uh, 200,000 songs. So uh, we have to deal with this kind of uh, huge amount of data. And in order to train a model, Marta will explain you uh, all the things that we have to do in order to download this into an instance and to load, uh, launch a model in that instance physically. Yes. So since we had all our data and we had all our data and the labels on a S3, well, uh, on a, on a, um, well, yeah. in the class, let's say. Okay, so um, we had to download it um, and train our model to do that. It was quite tricky, and but we finally could do it. So we had to launch an instance, a P2 large instance, which is an instance that allows us to use GPU. Um, and yeah, it uses TensorFlow, so it has an environment with TensorFlow. So this is the one we used to train our model. Uh, we decided to use CNN, of course. And basically, you can see uh, sorry, uh, here the uh, structure of the, the architecture of the CNN that we decided to use, uh, and it compiled. So, so the idea to train our our million well million songs million um short, uh, like 30 second songs and this is what we decided so here it comes the bad news <laughs> um so this architecture worked it compiled but uh there's still a small problem we haven't been able to to solve uh, for time reasons so we don't have uh, specific results yet. Uh, we we would we could see when it was training that um, our the the training started. So it, we started from a zero point five accuracy, but it started to grow up a little bit. The problem was that at some point we don't know why um, we had some issues with the like with the reading of the data, so we couldn't finish our model. Yeah, and here also the fact is that uh, we have so many data that uh, we will need several, also several epochs, and this takes one epoch, maybe it, it, it took, I think it was 12 hours or something like that. So yes. if, you, if you do like 20 epochs or so, uh, 
it's quite quite a, a, a large amount of time. I think that we have a very large data set, but we have very few time to to make this model or to or to make yeah to make this model uh, work. So I think that well we spend a lot of time to create this data set, and that's why uh, this experience was very enriching because we both learn a lot uh, of Amazon Web Services and how to to make some, well, let's say, triquinuelas in order to avoid this um, all the blogs that we have uh, from YouTube uh, in order to steal their their songs. So somehow the things that I highlight the most in this project that we were able to, to create a data set that um, you can found a data set of so many songs and the and the mp3 of these songs because uh, it's not you cannot uh, publicly um, uh, store these mp3 files so this is something that we we were able to do and i think that we have um, now we can uh, resume this project and when we want and i think that we will we will continue working on that and see if this if this approach works in order to to learn the the motions of the of the song. I, I just wanted to emphasize what David said. Um I think from reading um a lot and a lot of papers about that and reading uh, looking at a lot of websites, I think we have the biggest um uh, music data set so far because well I mean um uh, like, right because it as you said you cannot publish it. But um, this is quite uh, huge, and it, take, it took a lot of effort um, um, to, to start this trouble with the app, APIs and the the cloud systems. We had a lot of limitations, so I think also I agree with David. We learned a lot, uh, and at the end, the result. But <laughs> it's not the most important thing. We learned all we had to learn, so. Thank you all as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you guys. I think that you also did an amazing. It's it, the, the hardest part usually is so, uh, to get all the data and put it together so you can use it. So I'm sure that you did an amazing effort to do it. So it's really, really nice.